Hi, this is Matthew Cratter from Trader University. And today I want to talk a little bit more about this financial crisis, how the markets are broken, and how this is showing itself in the stock market uh, with oil trading negative and also with negative interest rates. If you're worried about this bear market, really want to understand the macro world that we're living in today, or just want to see how I'm trading it, be sure to hit that subscribe button. So for the last few years before the coronavirus uh, sort of pricked, pricked the uh, everything bu bubble, we saw many, many articles about how the Fed has saved the economy, these sort of uh, almost like Soviet propaganda articles about how we'd reached full, un full unemployment, there was no inflation, it was a Goldilocks economy, etc. And then along comes coronavirus, um, which may or may not be uh, extremely serious when we ultimately see the the, uh, the mortality rates. Uh, and what this virus showed us, and if it wasn't this virus, it probably should have, it would have been something else, is how our economy, our financial markets are fragile. They're not, they're not anti-fragile in the way Nassim Nicholas Taleb uh, would want things to be. Basically, we have artificial low volatility. We have artificial uh, central bank uh, intervent interventions and what this means is that things are actually very fragile and they can break in very weird ways and this is part of what we saw happening with uh, crude oil not only going to zero yesterday in the front month but going uh, extremely negative and it's still the front month is still trading negative all the uh, forward months are off uh, quite sharply now, um, there's a great quote from Ernest Hemingway's novel, The Sun Also Rises, uh, about how they asked, uh, one of the characters is asked, Mike Campbell is asked, so how did you go bankrupt? Uh, two ways, gradually and then suddenly. And this is often a metaphor that's applied to the financial markets. We get a long bull market in stocks, uh, it begins to roll over, and then all of a sudden, uh, basically all, all heck breaks loose. And... Uh, it's very similar, in fact, to dam failures, where you, there's just a trickle of water coming out and all of a sudden everything is released. So I want to talk a little bit about this sort of fragility and the fact that there's no, there's no free lunch when it comes to the markets, uh, even with central banks being in charge. So how do central banks act? They print money, they lower interest rates, they try to stimulate the economy this way. And they can do it by buying bonds, by buying treasuries, for example, or even buying junk bonds. But what happens is it leads to distortions, it leads to bubbles, and then things, when things break, they're much worse than they otherwise would have been. So we, we have, because of Fed policy, we'll have years and years and years. This is a chart of the uh, VIX, by the way, a weekly, a weekly chart. We'll have years and years and years of stability. Everyone will say everything's doing great. And then what will happen is the low volatility regime will end because of some external factor in the real world, like a virus or a war or a plague or something, and will enter a high volatility regime. And the problem with manipulating the economy like central banks do is that rather than having a sort of natural cycle, you basically, it's a little bit like heating up a, uh, uh, shaking a bottle, uh, a bottle of Coke, um, and uh, you can shake it and it stays contained but then when it actually breaks, rather than just having a pressure valve, uh, when it breaks, you get very, very high volatility. You get huge market crashes like we saw in February, uh, huge market uh, snapbacks as we've been seeing in, uh, in uh, April. And um, this is, this is um, uh, there's a chart of the S&P 500. You can see that we had a, uh, a death cross, 50-day moving average, the blue line crossing below the red line, the 200-day moving average. When the VIX is above 40, when the S&P 500 is below its 200-day moving average, that's when very bad things can happen. And whenever you see it trading like this, uh, you can see, for example, we've just bounced off the 50-day moving average, probably headed down another leg, unless the Fed uh, once again intervenes really, really strongly. But bad things happen. It's very important to remember, bad things happen after 10 years of really good times and especially bad things happen when the equity markets or the oil markets or anything is trading below its 200 day moving average. That's when you have to be uh, very careful. But of course there are fundamental reasons for this uh, and they have, they have knock on implications for the real world and the real economy. 
So lower oil prices are devastating for countries that depend on oil revenue. And a lot of these companies, a lot of these countries are, uh, uh, are problematic, at least from a U.S. perspective. Uh, I would argue the U.S. is actually the most most problematic uh, country, having its tendrils and tentacles everywhere, especially with its central bank policy. But when oil goes bad, down, economies that are dependent on oil, like Iran, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, I could add cu countries from Africa as well. And clearly Russia is not as dependent on oil as it once was. But you can have geopolitical things happen. You could have regime change in Iran or Russia or even Saudi Arabia. Now, why are central banks to blame for this? I'll give you a very small example of the distortions they can cause. So we've had many, many years of unnaturally low interest rates. And what this means is that it's very easy for people to borrow money, especially corporations, uh, to borrow money to fund ventures and projects. And it, it doesn't, these projects don't need to even turn out to be uh, profitable. So for example, the shale producers, the oil producers in the US, borrowed a lot of money. They were they were having a rough time even with oil at $50 a barrel. But with the Fed, with the central bank keeping interest rates low, they were able to fund prod, uh, projects that were unprofitable and uneconomic. But what they could do, why would someone do this? Well, you can prop up your own company stock with cheap financing, with cheap debt. You can make a lot of money as an equity holder, even if it has bad knock-on effects for the overall economy. So. Too, when interest rates are too low or there's too much money printing, you get distorted price signals. And what it means is unprofitable projects get funded. So in this case of the shale producers, they got funded even though they weren't profitable Profitable projects, even profitable at oil at $50 a barrel, not to mention oil at negative, uh, at negative prices. And as a result, there was a distortion. You got way too much oil. Now, obviously, there was a lot of demand destruction by the coronavirus, everyone staying home. Uh, but, but this was bound to, uh, to come home to roost, whether it was the virus, whether it was uh, another an, uh, an economic slowdown by, caused by something else. But basically, too much oil oversupply caused by the financing at low interest rates of projects that never should have been there. And so what happens? Oil goes negative. Shale producers go bankrupt. Now all the oil majors are in trouble. Uh, it's almost certain that Exxon Mobil is going to cut its dividend. Uh, people are getting just totally destroyed in the oil ETFs. I'll link to my video about that uh, below. But this is one of the problems with central bank intervention. You can have periods of low volatility and sort of this fake prosperity. And then uh, when the next crisis comes, it's much, much worse. So we had the dot-com bubble bursting. That was pretty bad in 2000 to 2002. We had uh, the great financial crisis, 2007 and 2009. That was even worse. The whole US financial system almost collapsed. And now we're getting something even weirder that cannot be fixed. We have this virus floating around globally. Uh, it kind of goes into remission in parts of the world. And then when they open back up, it comes back. And it almost doesn't matter whether the virus turns out to be super dangerous to uh, sort of normal, healthy uh, young people. The problem is the system is so fragile. And it's fragile because of central banks distorting price signals, dampening volatility unnaturally. And so when the genie's finally let out of the bottle, really, really bad things happen. And we've seen that distortion not only with negative oil prices, but also with negative bond yields, sovereign bond yields, which are, which are the bonds of, of entire countries. So here, for example, we have the, the German Bund, the German yield curve, and um, you can see that the yield uh, for the two-year bond is minus 0.71%. The yield for the five-year bond is minus 0.67%. It's, it's negative actually all the way going out 30 years. So what this means is that you are actually paying a bank, paying the government to own your money. Rather than receiving interest, you're actually paying interest. And as a result, you're going to get less uh, money back. So if you invest $100, you're going to get uh, $99 uh, back at maturity because of these negative interest rates. You're basically forced to buy them at a uh, at a premium to par, and then they will mature at par, and you'll actually end up losing money. And this is this is found all around the world. So Japan has had negative interest rates uh, for quite some time. Uh, Two-year yield at minus 0.15, five-year five yield at minus 0.1. 
And the U.S. is uh, almost certainly going to go to a flat uh, a zero yield curve or even negative. Right now, the front end is um, really close to zero. It's really pinned at zero by the uh, by the Fed. And then uh, even if you go out 10 years, we're only at like 50 basis points or so. Here's a good map showing uh, in the, uh, the sort of the Eurozone plus uh, the Swiss, Swiss Bank, uh, Denmark, etc. cetera. The, uh, the pink shows negative interest rates of minus 0.5%. The yellow, Switzerland and Denmark shows negative interest rates of minus 0.75%. Now this was an interesting, there's a great talk by Peter Thiel, whom I used to work for, I've known for many, many years, known since college. Uh, and he had a great quote in this uh, recent video called The Straussian Moment, where he quotes, uh, I don't know if it's Marx he's quoting or Marxist theorists, saying that the time for communism is when interest rates go to zero. Obviously, when they go to negative, we're past the time. It could be interpreted, if you're a communist, if you're a Marxist, uh, which I'm certainly not, and Peter is not either. He's much more libertarian. Uh, but zero interest rates, what's often known as ZIRP, Z-I-R P, Z Z I R P zero um, interest rate uh, policy. It's a sign that capitalists no longer have any idea what to do with their money, and this can be an explanation for why we're increasingly seeing sort of more socialist uh, and, and nationalist candidates uh, worldwide, and certainly certainly in the U S. as well. Now, I'm not I'm not suggesting that uh, because interest rates are at zero that we should enter a socialist regime. But it does show that there's something very strange with the capitalist system. There's something very strange going on uh, and broken. Uh, and so you get, you get distortions like negative, uh, negative oil prices. You have a Danish bank launching the world's first negative interest rate mortgage. So, uh, and this happened, um, this happened in 2019, so it's a few months old. But what happens is when interest rates go negative for the government debt, it can enable banks to issue negative interest rate mortgages where you basically get paid to borrow money. And you can imagine the distortions, distortions this causes in property markets and asset values. What if someone pays you to take out a mortgage? Doesn't that mean that housing prices should go way, way, way up? So you get these very strange distortions that's bad for savers because you're earning a negative interest rate. But if you're a borrower, it's good. And uh, a negative interest rate system really incents borrowers to uh, take on more debt at a time when there's already too much debt. So these are the kind of distortions we see. Um, some of you have asked me to talk about Michael Burry and index funds. Uh, it's really a topic for, for a full video, but he's got a great quote in that same interview where he says central banks in Basel III, which is, was a regulation regime from a few years back, have more or less removed price dis discovery from the credit markets, meaning risk does not have accurate pricing mechanism in interest rates anymore. And this is combined with sort of passive investing where you buy the S&P 500, you don't really know what's in it, uh, but you just buy it because you want to get the market return. Now this sort of thing works when not everyone is doing it. But if something like, I've seen estimates that something like 70% uh, of uh, people invested in stocks worldwide or certainly in the US are either indexing directly, meaning they buy the in stock indices or they're sort of shadow indexing. And what happens then is you no longer, if everyone's a passive investor, you no longer have any active investors yet who are actually doing fundamental analysis on these companies deciding how they should be priced. And so while indexing worked very well when uh, not everyone was doing it, once everyone works, once everyone starts to do it, uh, it makes you wonder what can blow up. And uh, one of the biggest problems with this is, is that uh, at a certain point, central banks will come in as well and buy these indices. So maybe, maybe they don't crash in the way Michael Burry is suggesting, uh, simply because the central bank will come in as they did in Japan and just start buying ETFs, start buying stocks directly to prop up the market. And so what this means is that the world of fundamental analysis of Warren Buffett, of, um, of Ben Graham, who was Buffett's mentor. Ben Graham's famous for saying that uh, in the short run, the market is a voting machine, but in the long run, it's a weighing machine. 
And what he meant by this is that you can get strange bubbles, strange movements in the short, in the short term for a, uh, a stock, let's say like Amazon, for example, ran up very sharply in the late 90s and then crashed. That would be, there are a lot of psychological effects there. But then presumably over the long term, the stock market is a weighing machine and is able to determine, to, de to determine the value and the correct valuation of a company. But what Graham is assuming here, he's assuming free markets. He's assuming markets that are not, not manipulated through unnaturally low interest rates and money printing by central banks. And so in this kind of environment, uh, it becomes very difficult. It almost becomes unnecessary to do fundamental analysis. What you really need to know is, is the stock that I own in this particular index that the Fed may buy someday. And so I thought there was a great um, quote from Sven Henrich, a Northman trader, uh, negative interest rates, mortgage companies pay us to live in our homes, which we talked about, negative oil, gas stations pay us to fill up, the Fed will save them all, who needs a job anyway? Uh, sort of taking things to their, um, their uh, logical or illogical conclusion. So I think what's, what's very important right now is to not succumb to, um, not succumb to what's often called normalcy bias, which is people think that things are going to be the way they've been in the recent past. So if you've only been investing for the past 10 years or the past 20 years, or really even just the past 50 years, it's been an unusual period, falling interest rates uh, and increasing central bank activism. Uh, it's a mistake to think that things will be the same going forward. Uh, if we look at Federal Reserve assets, so what the U.S. Central Bank is holding on their balance sheet as a percentage of GDP. You can see that the period really from 1945 up until the great financial crisis of 2008-2009, we had a shrinking Fed balance sheet. And this is, this is all normalized as an expression, as a, as, a, uh, as a function of nominal GDP or the overall economic uh, output. So we, we had this, this long period of it falling. Uh, now we've entered a period really since the, uh, since the great financial crisis where the central bank's uh, balance sheet has been growing both in, in, in absolute nominal terms as well as, it, as, a, as a fraction of the whole US GDP. Right here we're breaking out above levels never even seen during the Great Depression. Uh, you can see that the period of uh, really since the stock market crash of 29 through World War II was a, was a similar similar period. And so people who are buying the S&P 500 on dips, people who think that the market is going to behave going forward the way it's behaved in the past, I think are making a mistake and are suffering from normalcy bias because this is the regime we're in. We're not in this regime anymore. And this makes sense as there's a generational handoff from the baby boomers uh, in part to the Gen Xers and to the millennials and Zoomers. They're, these things, there are demographic reasons for it. There are also these larger economic cycles that always involve, uh, involve debt. And right now we're seeing just tremendous, uh, tremendous increase in debt and in central bank uh, money printing. Right here, this is a chart of the, uh, of the Fed's uh, balance sheet. If we go back and look over a really long period, you can see that the first time that it really it really spiked was during this recession here, the great period during the great financial crisis. Uh, it continued to grow through the prosperous last decade uh, when they tried to reel in their balance sheet at the end of um, in 2018, caused a mini uh, a mini crash. We had a, a huge spike in the VIX that blew up a lot of volatility products. Uh, then they were able to write things and start growing the um, balance sheet again in 2019. Even when the economy was still, still doing well, when the S&P was at all-time new highs, they were, uh, we were still seeing cracks in the financial system in terms of the repo crisis and the Fed having to cut interest rates while the S&P was hitting new highs and having to grow their balance sheet. And now, uh, this year, we're really just going off the chart the Fed's balance sheet approaching uh, 6.4 million. This is probably going to go to, I'm sorry, trillion, 6.4 trillion. This is easily going to go to 10 trillion. It probably goes to 20 or 30 trillion. There's really nothing that can be done 
at this point. Um, here's a nice chart of the, uh, these are the, the changes, the rate of change of, um, of uh, M2, which is one form of the, uh, of the uh, money supply. So these are the yearly, uh, the yearly changes. And you can see very uncharted, uncharted territory here. It looks like a momentum stock. Uh, that's going that's going uh, going parabolic so I want you all when you hear um, various things said by the financial media or if you have your own biases from the last few years of investing I want to make sure that you are quite aware of normalcy bias and make sure you don't succumb to it and uh, I'm currently spending a lot of time trying to think about how the world has changed post coronavirus and um, it's, I'll just finish with one, uh, <laughs> one sort of jab. It's, it's very interesting. Here's an article from, back from last year about uh, some, someone at, block, at Davos um, talking about how Bitcoin's gonna go to zero. And what we actually got is oil going to zero. Bitcoin is still at six or $7,000 of Bitcoin. So for people who think that this is a tulip bubble, that Bitcoin is a scam, that it's a pyramid scheme, that it can be shut down by the government, that it's uh, junk internet money. Just remember, look look with your eyes. Oil is trading at zero or sub-zero for many of the futures months. And uh, Bitcoin is still close to $7,000, uh, only down a little bit in 2020. So something to keep in mind. Make sure you keep questioning your assumptions. And uh, together we can think through all of this. If you found this um, this lecture helpful, I'd encourage you also to check out my online courses, especially if you have a lot of free time now at home. Um, a very good one in here would be the bear market trading strategies, as well as learn to trade futures like a pro. Uh, if, you're, if you're interested in wading into the commodity futures markets or the stock index futures markets, as well as um, my flagship course on learn to trade stocks like a pro uh, and a couple options trading courses as well. Please be very careful trading these markets uh, you don't have to take my courses, but make sure before you trade options or futures or anything like this, or even uh, Bitcoin or crypto, make sure you know what you're doing and invest in your education. Again, it doesn't have to be my courses, but make sure you're studying with someone, whether it's free YouTube videos or paid courses, because if you don't know what you're doing, especially in these markets with things changing so, so quickly, uh, you will get your head handed to you and you'll end up paying tuition anyway in the form of uh, trading losses. So if these courses are something that interests you, you can uh, just check out the link in the description notes below. You can go, uh, you can click on any of these to see the curriculum, to see the list of lectures. And uh, if it's something that interests you, you can just scroll down here and click get it now, which will take you to the checkout page. Now, monthly tuition, 30 days access is normally just $125. And that gets you access to all 13 courses. But we're in a recession now. This is very crazy time. So I want to give you guys a uh, coupon code to use to take a little money off. Um, and it's YT, as in YouTube, 99. Click that update button and it'll take $26 off. So uh, 30 day tuition will just be $99 instead of $125. Again, no long-term contracts or anything. So you can watch the entire video, watch all the courses, all the lectures uh, and cancel before it renews and you won't be charged again or you can stay stay on board. I'm continually coming out with new courses and lectures. And as a subscriber, if there's something you'd like to see added to the curriculum, you just let me know and I'll record a course or lecture for you. And of course, share it with everyone else who's a sus subscriber at Trader University Premium. Hit that subscribe and like button if you found this video helpful and let me know your questions or comments in the comment section below. Hope you're all staying well and staying sane and I'll see you in the next video.